This is our 430th meeting since we started in February 2009. We put a speaker on every week, a different subject. We require a speaker to take a position on an issue <coughs> me, for expensive point of view. They have to be for or against something. We don't care what it is. We give an hour to make a presentation. If they go over an hour, we cut them off. If anybody interrupts the speaker, remind the interrupter, we list only one fool at a time, one of our rules. Then we have questions and answers from the audience, not speeches, of the speaker. And we have remarks, rebuttals, everybody in this audience at once, who gets five minutes at the podium, respond to the speaker said, for or against. And then our speaker gets the last word, gets a comment, and a comment, and close the meeting. But before we put our speaker on, we have time for announcements. Anybody have any announcements they want to make? Now's the time. Any announcements? Uh, no philosophers forum is second Tuesday of October, yeah. which is, uh, I'm not sure what it is. It's on the 9th or 10th. Yeah, I don't know. First, second Tuesday, whatever second it is. Tuesday. Second Tuesday, all right. Yeah, second Tuesday. Philosophers forum. That's at Adelia and? That's uh, Skill and Adelia, right? Skill and Adelia. It's the 9th. October 9th. Yeah. October 9th, yeah. all right. Sounds good. Yeah, Any other announcements? No, uh, that's it. Well, then our our speaker, oh, I got a couple of announcements. Uh, next week, uh, uh, October 6th, uh, we're going to have uh, on why I identify with Beto O'Rourke. That's uh, Michelle Valentino. She's going to talk about that. So that ought to bring out some people for and against. October 13th, J. Frank Norris, the top of the, Bill, top of the Hill Casino. That's uh, Jim Gatewood. He's a, he's a Dallas author. It ought to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, October 20, October 20th will be Jane and Lee. I don't have it on here yet. She's going to send me Yay. something. And October 27th, uh, recognizing that the only thing to fear is for itself. That's Julie Britton. She's sitting right there. She's Yay. our speaker. Yay. And November 3rd, uh, on lessons from Karl Marx, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's uh, John Beasley. He'll be talking about that. It should be good. Anyway, before our speaker tonight, is uh, going to talk about comfort women, victims of Japanese military social slavery, sexual slavery, as un an uncorrected outrage with sex trafficking to this day, shouting for re rectification. Her name is. Ask her. Simon Pak. Simon. That's what I couldn't pronounce. But it's Simon Pak. She was. She's a. Uh, a strong, I can't read my own writing here. Advocate? <laughs> uh, uh, let her read it. You don't have here, let you read it. But anyway, uh, anyway, she's going to talk about what I just mentioned. Well, and without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Simon Pak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to College of Complexes for inviting me here to share uh, this topic. Now, how many of you already are familiar with the issue of comfort women? I am. Okay. So, or are there some people who have never heard of the term comfort women? Okay. Okay. So basically, they were sex slaves during World War II for Japanese military soldiers. Um, and by the way, my name is Simon Park, and in case you wanted to get in touch with me, my email is unforgottenbutterflies at gmail.com. And butterflies represent comfort women survivors. Okay, so comfort women, they were sex slaves. Um, they were trafficked to serve as sex slaves for the Japanese Imperial Army during World War II. And you'll be surprised. When you think of uh, comfort women, you know, a lot of people he probably heard the news, you know, about issue between Japan and Korea. Right. But it's not, there were not girls just from Korea. Can you name all the countries that were girls that were victims? Uh, Vietnam. Vietnam? Yeah, any place the Japanese were there. That's right. And all the places that are Japanese. And, and so they occupied the Philippines. Exactly. I think especially in the Philippines. Too. That's right. But did you know there were Dutch females? German females. Mm -hmm. Did you know there were American nurses mm -hmm. who were prisoners of war? They were also comfort women. So a lot of people think this issue just happened in Asian countries. It's not true. It really affected 
every, I mean, all, all women from pretty much every continent. So, um, I just wanted to make sure, you know, my purpose is to raise awareness and educate about the issue of comfortable women. And I want to make it clear, this is not about any type of like anti-Japanese, you know, bash, no, it's not about like um, Japan bashing or trying to create any type of um, anti-Japanese sentiment. This is strictly about human rights, women's rights, and war crime. So, there were people, first of all, the Japanese Imperial Army enslaved tens of thousands of women, euphemistically called comfortable women, from around 1932 to end of the World War II, 1945. The victims were Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean, Filipino, Malaysian, Indonesian, Dutch, East Timorese, and Japanese. And ex-soldiers have also disclosed in memoirs and interviews that women from Vietnam, Thailand, Burma, and the USA were also forced into prostitution. And you can get that more information at the Amnesty uh, 2005 report. And the number that they estimate the girls that were trafficked were 200,000 girls. Wow. But currently, Chinese scholars, they claim there were additional 200,000 girls just from China alone that were trafficked. Yeah, I heard so, and in Korea right now, there are only 27 survivors. And the average age is in their 90s. And this is the map. It's kind of hard to see. Well, but maybe the lights, the lights really can you, you know, like, can you lights. expand? But anyway, you see all these red dots. This is part of, this is Korea. Uh -huh. This is Japan. You can see my curve. Right. Sure, right? And so, uh, like, Vietnam, Taiwan, I mean, they were all over Philippines. Right. Um, pre pretty much wherever there were, like you said, wherever there were Japanese soldiers, they created comfort stations just to you know, serve their Japanese soldiers. And these ladies or these girls, they were average like 14, 15, 16. Um, they, they were pretty much treated like a military cop. So it was very inhumane. And most of them, they said that survive, survival rate was about three months because most of the girls were not physically capable. Um, and most of the girls were not physically developed to handle what they had to handle. Mm -hmm. And also, a um, lot of, and th the reason why this issue is so relevant today is because sex trafficking is still happening in Dallas, in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And are you aware there are 400 girls on the street in Dallas mm -hmm. every night, and there are 300,000 people that are trafficked annually. Wow. And the, third, the, the average age in the U.S. that are trafficked or gets into trafficking is 13 years old. Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> and then the, just Dallas alone, the annual, like the earning, I guess, the profit is a $99 million business. So this is pretty serious in its current. So, and what what is really amazing is that the way the method that these girls that were trafficked during World War II is pretty much the same method, promised of a better paying job. Some are sold by their family due to poverty, or some are just literally picked up from the street and just kidnapped. So, so let's see. They so you know, many scholars. They, some, I mean, the number that we go by is 200,000, but like I said, Chinese scholars, they claim there were additional 200,000. And like, according to different scholars, the numbers vary, but pretty much some say 90,000, 45,000, but the average number that we go by is like 200,000. And a lot of people, they said it's, you know, very underestimated. But here, if you look at this, um, it says, so different scholars have different numbers. So how many, how many each come from girls that had, for example, this scholar says one for 50 soldiers, one for 100 soldiers, one for 30 soldiers, one for 150 soldiers. But I know they're in China, in China, they uh, just discovered a document, official document, and they said it was one to 200 soldiers. So can you imagine? So, 
So you can understand. Um, How long are their lifespan was? Sure. Most of them, they said about 25 percent did not survive. And so they did not survive to tell how horrific their experiences was. So we mm -hmm. probably, what we know is pretty much the tip of the iceberg right. of what really happened. Right. And the, here, the ethnic portion of military confiscation personnel who went to China through province, this is in um, province of Taiwan from November 1938 to December 39. So this is just in the Taiwan um, province. And here we have Japanese, we have Korean, and Taiwanese girls. So another thing I want to stress is that there were Japanese girls who were comfort girls. And right now, Japanese government, they completely deny, or they refuse to acknowledge. But you know, here I am. I'm not just talking about just Korean or Chinese or Vietnamese comfort girls. We're talking about Japanese comfort girls, too. And I hope that Japanese people, more Japanese people will stand up and speak for their comfort girls. Because I'm sure, according to the Japanese government, they said these girls were willing participants and prostitutes. But I'm sure, I don't think there was at least a willing girl who, who would like to do that. No way. No. And I hope there will be more Japanese citizens that will stand up and speak up for these girls for their own Japanese comfort women. So this is just like one of the testimony that comfort, former comfort uh, women said. So I just want to say, and you have, have you seen these photos? Did any of you seen these photos? No? So these are the Japanese soldiers waiting for their turn. And these, actually, she was, she is pregnant. And these are the comfort girls. Um, you can kind of get an idea what kind of situation they were. But a lot of them, they, you, I'm going to just read you this. Um, then at night, we were called and confined to a room. It was a terrible job. I was only weeping. In the daytime, I sewed clothes and did the soldier's laundry. It was easy, but at night, I died. I was dying. I felt as if I was dead. I wished to flee away, but I did not know the way. Soldiers were standing at the gate. If you fled, you will be shot. I was too young. I did not know anything. We were dragged there, and it was hell. It is not a place for a human being to live. It was a slaughterhouse where so many young girls died. More than half a century had passed. I had learned to accept suffering. I also learned to forgive. Telling my story has made it easier for me to be reconciled with the past, but I am still hoping to see justice done before I die. So that was, so you can imagine, during the, during the daytime, they had to work. Some they had to cook, some they had to mend clothing for soldiers. So they weren't just doing the night um, job, the daytime, they had to work. So pretty much they were like a military club. So, before I talk about the person who came, who was a really a brave woman, that before she came out and spoke, you wonder, it was only in 1991, first women that ever came out and really put this issue to light. Otherwise, it would have just gone under the rug and it could have been just gone and died out with them. But it was a Korean woman named Kim Hak-soon. In 1991, she spoke. So, this happened like in the, during World War II, and it was only as recent as 1991. And then after she came out, all these women from different countries, different parts of the world, she, they started to come out. And then the Dutch lady, uh, Filipino, Chinese, I mean, they all started to come out. And you understand, like in Korea, the highest probably the aspiration at that time for a girl would be, you know, growing up nicely, you know, and finding a good man to marry and just be a good housewife to raise children. That was probably what they wanted, like mothers wanted their children to grow up to be. But, you know, so for somebody to go through what they have done, can you imagine coming out to the society and, you know, revealing what, had, what you just, I mean, you, what you had gone through it is imaginable. Considering that even now, in our present time, 21st century, you know, uh, just with Diane Feinstein, uh, Democratic senator from California, 
with the hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, even now, like the present lady, it's ladies, it's so hard for us to come out and, you know, speak about mm -hmm. the issue. So you have to understand how extra, extra difficult it would have been for these women, especially in Asian, you know, from Asia, Asian country, for these girls to come out after they return. Um, this is something like current. So Diane Weinstein, she was talking, you know, right before the hearing on the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh. She said, sexual violence is a serious problem and one that largely goes unseen. In the United States, it is estimated by the Center for Disease Control, one in three women and one in six men will experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. Now, she said, last week I received a letter from a 60-year-old California constituent who told me that she survived an attempted rape at age 17. She's described as being terrified and embarrassed she never told a soul until much later in life. The assault stayed with her for 43 years. While, but while young women are standing up and saying no more, our institution have not progressed in how they treat women who come forward. Too often women in memories and credibility come under assault. In essence, they are put on trial and forced to by defend themselves and often victimize in the process. So this is in America. So again, just imagine how difficult it would have been in Asian country. But this lady right here, her name is Kim Hak Sun, and she's the really, I mean, we really owe to her that this issue really gains some light and being picked up and a lot of people are fighting for justice for comfort women. So I will sh share like a video about her later. So um, now, so every Wednesday in Korea, there's a demonstration going on. Um, actually, it started in January 1st, 1992, after Kim Hak Sun came out in 1991. So on their thousand protests, on December 14, 2014, they decided to erect a memorial. You see, I have a miniature, miniature me memorial there. Can you, and hold that? Can you hold that up? Sure. So this is like a miniature statue, and actually it's like a pretty large size, and they erected this like in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul on their thousandth protest. And it's still going every Wednesday at noon, they have that. Let the camera see it. Yeah, see that, I, I got it, I got it, I got it good, yeah. thank you. Okay, and what they, what they really want, the demand that these uh, people are making is that they acknowledge, Japan acknowledge the war crime, reveal the truth, and, and it's entirely about the crimes of military sexual slavery, make an official apology by the Japanese government, make legal reparation, punish those responsible for the war crime, accurately record the crime in history textbook, and erect a memorial for victims of military sexual slavery and establish a, history, a historical museum, which they don't, they're not doing, they're refusing. So, oops. So, this is a little bit of uh, explanation about peace statue, but I think I will just skip that one. But compared to, because Japan is still refusing to acknowledge and they're, they claim that these girls were willing participants and they were prostitutes, so they, they say there's no forced, they, were, they said there was, there was no proof. And that was one of the reasons why Kim Hak Sun, she came out because when Japanese government kept on saying there was no proof of enforcement, then she came out saying, what do you mean there's no proof? I'm the, I'm the living proof right here. So she came out. And the, the difference between Japan and Germany during war, you know, the war crime they committed during World War II. This is West Germany Chancellor. He knelt and war signed 1972 to apologize for the Holocaust. So this is very clear. There's no doubt, no question, you know, how he felt. 
And this action became a symbol of Germany's sincere appeal for reconciliation to the rest of the world, greatly contributing world peace. But Japan, you know, they're still not owning up to their action. And the emperor of Japan, he was never put on a trial. Like not, you know, Hitler. I mean, if he was alive, do you think he could have gone on and just lived on his life? Well, Japanese emperor, he pretty much, no trial, and he pretty much carried on as an emperor. Um, so, when you think of Nazi, it's exactly the same thing as the Japanese Imperial Army. That's pretty much, you know, they're vicious, they're, I mean, they're inhumane, they're like violated human rights. And then swastika and the rising sun. When you see the flag of rising sun, you know, to Asians, it's pretty much equivalent to the symbol of swastika. But now, you know it's illegal, like in Germany, it's illegal to deny Holocaust, it's illegal to have swastika, you know, on. But in Japan, I mean, even now, like in America too, you know, some people think it's kind of trendy to have that rising sun flag, and it really should not be used that. I mean, we should be, people should be more knowledgeable and understand the meaning of rising sun. So that should not be used as something like trendy, fence, you know, um, thing. So again, like Japan, you know, they're still refusing to acknowledge and apologize. And there were so many legislation enacted specifically demanding an apology and compensation from the government of Japan for World War II, sex slave crime. Like for example, US Congress Resolution HR, House of Resolution 121 was passed in 2007. Canadian Parliament, 2007, European Parliament, Philippine House of Resolution, South Korean National Assembly Resolution, Taiwan National Assembly Resolution, they all said, hey, Japan, you know, you did, this was a war crime. You, and then this is a violation of human rights. You really do need to own up and apologize. But what happened? No, still nothing, still nothing. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I am here sharing with you because I feel like education, through raising awareness and education, we can, hopefully, we can change that. You know, as long as everybody knows the truth, I hope that Japan will not be able to get away. And that's what I'm trying to do. So, for example, um, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, his grandfather was a war criminal. Um, and he visits uh, to the Yakusuni Shrine, which is in Tokyo, where all the war, like Class A war criminal, criminal are buried. And he still goes there. And you know, a lot of people protest, but he still goes, he does that. And then another thing is that he retracted Kano's statement that was made on August 4, 1993, which was, actually it was a Kono, the chief cabinet secretary, he did say that there, I'm gonna just do the quote. The then Japanese military was directly or indirectly involved in the establishment and management of the comfort stations and the transfer of comfort, Is 
Yeah. Maybe we don't need it. We can just yeah. Well, maybe this happened. <coughs> okay. I'm not sure what to do on that. Mm -hmm. There should be. Well, maybe if you hit the uh, F8 key. Okay, it, it may be the projector here because I just unplugged it and nothing happened. Nothing showed up. It should show if I unplug it. It's not getting anything. So, where, where's our power switch here? We, you know, I think we have a power switch. Yeah, it's very Or you can just unplug it for a second. Yeah. Yeah. There it goes. Okay. All right. Turn it back on as soon as you can here. How big is it? Come back in, I guess. Where's my HDMI? Here? There it is, okay. Twenty-six dollars, okay. Whoa! No, it's not. I don't know what it's not. Uh, I'm not getting anything. Means 
to live. Mm. So most of the, and a lot of the, like they actually said like 70 to 80% were Korean girls. Yeah. Because you have to understand during that time, Korea was under the Japanese rule, mm -hmm. Japanese right. occupation. That's right. So right. Korea really did not have their sovereignty. So they didn't have an army or? No. They, and what was the age group? What did they go to from like 4, 13 to what? 50, 60, or young girls, just young girls? Oh, they, actually, they pretty much wanted young girls because yes, they were trying to protect, protect the Japanese soldier from getting any type of sexual disease. So they really wanted the virgin. So that's why, actually, in Korea, they married off their young daughters off really quickly so that a lot of girls would not get um, right. yeah. taken. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that happened. That was really sick. And, well, you know, what's really sad is that Japan is still refusing to acknowledge. That's right. And they That's still it. haven't given an official apology. And actually, in 2016, Korean uh, survivor named Lee ok -sun, she came and she actually spoke at SMU. And she spoke, she went to Kapel High School and she shared And you know what she said? She said, you know, I am still traveling. She was 90 years old at that time. And she said, you know, I am still traveling because unfortunately my country, Korea, is still too weak. So they cannot solve this situation alone. So I am traveling, I'm asking your help, I'm asking your support. Yes. And, you know, basically, we, Japan will not acknowledge nor apologize. Especially if, the, like, people from Asia are speaking about it. But if Americans, if we speak up, then Japan will listen and they will do something. And that's another reason why I am speaking to you. And that's why I feel like it is so essential that in Dallas we do more to raise awareness and educate. <coughs> and so actually, so in 1993, Kono, cabinet secretary, he did say that Japanese military was you know, directly, indirectly, we were involved. But uh, unfortunately, you want me to go ahead and read this whole thing? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so he said, the then Japanese military was directly or indirectly involved in the establishment and man management of the comfort stations and the transfer of comfort women. The government study has revealed that in many cases they were re recruited against their own will through coercing, coercion, etc. And that at times, administrative military personnel directly took part in the recruitment. They lived in misery at comfort stations under a coercive atmosphere. Undeniably, this was an act with the involvement of the military authorities of the day that severely injured the honor and dignity of many women. So he did say, but it was never an official apology. Like when we talk about official apology, meaning like the government, the diet, or did you know, like they they pass and say yes, we owe you know we did this, we owe them reparation, we need you know. Apology, but that never happened. So, this is a little bit I really wanted to show you. But you know, there are a lot of Japanese, um, Japanese national. They are, you know, they are advocating for comfort women. And so, for example, I, I do want to show this image. Like, for example, you know, there are Japanese scholars. Can you see? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is a Japanese scholar, he's Mr. Takashi Uemura. He was the first Japanese journalist covered and wrote about comfort women in August 1991. He and even his young daughter were life-threatened due to his work and his firm stand with justice for com comfort women. And he's Professor Kosaki Uji, and actually he's teaching in Korea, like Sejong University. And he's writing books, and he's like you know um, studying the documents, official do Japanese document to reveal. And then here is Ando Dura. He's a he's a Japanese professor. He's a, a professor of philosophy in Station Girls University in Japan. And actually, this is one of the Korean survivor, and he came and he apologized. So there are Japanese people who are like you know apologetic, and actually they're they come to. They come to Korea, or they go to Korea, actually to the house, it's, there's a shelter called House of Sharing, it's, the, it's a shelter where these women, um, they live together, and actually many people visit, many Japanese students, they actually go there to visit, because they have a museum and they actually try to learn. 
So it's really the government, it's really the Abe government that is like being really resisting to acknowledge the past. So, you know, Albert Einstein said the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. And so I'm really hoping there are only 27 survivors in Korea, and they're in their 90s, and you know, maybe Japan think that, thinks that um, as, you know, when these women all pass away, you know, they think this issue can be just be gone and be raised, but we cannot let that happen. And the word, term, comfort women, there was absolutely nothing comforting. But they did that. They used that term. They do it. They do it so nicely and kind of sneaky in a way to make it kind of like they try to evade and like revise and whitewash. So we really need to be aware what they're trying to do. And Japan, Japanese government, right now currently they they're spending like five hundred million dollars in the U.S. alone just for their publicity, goodwill, good image. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing wrong about their culture and people, but the government, if they cannot acknowledge their fault and what they have done wrong, I mean, that was a crime against humanity, and yet they, they still cannot own up to that. And yet they're spending millions to kind of, you know, paint beautiful whitewash, you know, beautiful painting, which is not really accurate, then it's kind of dangerous. So I want people to understand that, you know, there's more that we need to be aware of. And for me, I see it as like a butterfly effect. You know, here I am sitting, I mean, standing here and speaking to you. It's a small group, but I feel that through the butterfly effect, you know, that maybe we can really turn things around and change things and make the, bring justice for comfort women. It has been said that sometimes as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing, can ultimately change a typhoon halfway around the world. So maybe here to Japan is kind of far, but maybe what we do here, maybe we can make a difference. Maybe we can make an impact. And maybe we can persuade Japanese governments, you know, realize, finally realize, you know, it might be actually more smarter and honorable thing to do to acknowledge and apologize than try to hide and kind of think and try to revise and rewrite history. So what you can do, please help raise awareness. Share on social media about comfort women or share with your friends, families about comfort women because still too many people are completely unaware. Like for example, if we all know who stole the cookie from the cookie jar, do you think that the person who took the cookie from the cookie jar can deny? No. No. So I, that, that's my, you know, that's my thinking. As long as we are all aware what they really did, then I feel like Japan will finally get it. You know, it's just easier for them to just acknowledge and apologize. And please, actually, I have a movie called Spirit Home Coming. I mean, there are a lot of movies um, that I try to screen for free just to raise awareness. And I'm always looking for organizations, uh, clubs, congregation, university to screen. And I have screened this movie at SMU, UNT, TCU, and um, and school, university in Atlanta, Missouri, so I travel too. But um, actually, so if you could help me connect with any organization that, you know, were willing to watch this movie, it's a movie made based on a true story of a survivor, um, then that would be also helpful. And please become an upstander for comfort one. And let's turn the tide and make DFW Texas the tipping point for Japan to acknowledge and officially apologize. And, I did have a, like a little tease, like a, a movie preview, but I don't know if we can. If we can get it, we'll do it. And then I also walked Shikoku pilgrimage. Shikoku is a, one of the four islands in Japan. Um, they have 88 temples. And what I did was I walked for 48 days on foot. <laughs> and that's equivalent to like about 750 miles. And I, you know, I did that because I actually took pictures. I took this statue with me, and I took pictures at every temple. And I prayed, and I hope I did that to honor and remember these women. But also at the time, at the same time, I was praying and hoping that Japan, like people in Japan, would learn about this issue accurately. And hopefully, maybe there will be more uh, people from Japan that would acknowledge and 
you know, they become, they get compassionate and they become upstander right. for comfort women. So I have done that and that was my personal thing. And another uh, info I wanted to share is October 10th, that's, is it next, next, next Wednesday? Wednesday? At 6 p.m. at SMU at McCor Auditorium, we are going to screen that movie called Spirit's Homecoming. So if you, and then also I will be sharing about my experience about Chicago pilgrimage. And then also there will be 10 paintings done by survivors to view. And then we will do postcard writing for survivors. That the, uh, they, uh, to, and then we will send it to the House of Sharing. And um, so that's that. And how, how much t more time do we have? What time is it? It's uh, almost an hour you use. Uh, I did? Okay. All right. So, little thing about the art. Can I say a little bit more about the movie? Sure. Uh, can I say a little bit more about the movie? Yeah. Actually, this is, I mean, if you guys could come, that would be fantastic. If you could share um, and bring friends, it would be fantastic. It's free, and we will, I, there will be some food. And But this movie is really interesting because it took 14 years to make. And the director happened to go to a place called House of Sharing. It's a shelter where these women, you know, survivors live. And when he saw this painting called Burning Virgin, these survivors, they drew paint, you know, they painted as like an art therapy. And she drew what she remembered. And what it was was like, you know, young girls thrown into a ditch and burnt alive when they were too weak to serve. So when he saw this painting, he was so shocked. As a Korean man, he did not know about this issue. So he felt so bad that he decided to create a film. And so this film is made based on a true story of a survivor named Kang Il Chu. That's what she experienced. And this movie was made with 75,270 individual donors who donated five bucks, 25 bucks, and was able to raise enough money and make the film. And it's very powerful. And I would, you know, I would. And the director feels that every time he screens this movie, he's helping one spirit kind of return home through his film. So he hopes to screen this like 200,000 times. And I'm trying to do help him. And I think this uh, movie is great because it explains about the Korea, like the time, at the time when Korea was under the Japanese rule. It kind of explained what Korea was like. And you know, it gives you a kind of deep understanding and it's very moving. It's not an easy movie to watch, but I feel like, you know, we cannot shun away because it's too difficult. We have to face it. And we have to learn because Japan was able to get away because a lot of people were able to kind of kind of turn because they thought it was too gruesome, too, you know, not unpleasant. So we need to kind of change and, you know, we need to kind of stand up and really be the voices and faces for these young girls who perished in a foreign land with horrific, horrific death. So thank you very much. Okay, so in Korea right now, are people angry? How do the Korean people feel? About you mean the it? citizens of Korea? Yeah, the citizens, the grandmothers. The, you know, I'm Jewish, so I know how I feel okay. about the Holocaust. Yeah. Yes, I mean, is it taught? Do they? Well, you know, actually in the beginning, a lot of these women, they blamed themselves. themselves. They thought it was their fault. They, you know, it's like now, even now, right? A lot of women, girls, that did I dress different? I mean, you know, so a lot of these girls, they were too ashamed. So many of them, um, they did not come back to Korea. Only few come back, came back. Among those who survived, only few came back and they never shared. They didn't share. Okay. And, and actually in 1991, when she, you know, came out. So she came out, and all these women started to come out. When they first came out, Korean society really turned their back, and they were like, they were really, really mean. So, for example, the House of Sharing is a shelter. Now they have their own building, they have their own place, and they have a museum, and they have. But it actually started out with the Korean monk, and because all these girls were, I mean, not girls, all these women, they were living in poverty. So, Korean monk like rented a room. They started out with a room. And actually the neighbor, like neighboring people, they were protesting, they didn't want these girl, women to be living in their neighborhood because they thought they were, you know, not clean. Right. 
But things have completely turned around now. Like Koreans, uh, they're rallying for them. They support them. They have protests every Wednesday. And so it's, it's completely different now. It's a good thing. So the religion in Japan mm -hmm. and in Korea are different religions, right? Or well, the same? Yes. So what? So it was the government. It wasn't the religious people that turned a blind eye. It was the government of Japan that forced these women. Right. It was. It actually was the government. Yes, military government. It was the military government. And I'm, I'm going to share you like one personal story. I knew some Japanese people, like friends, and you know I had no problem with her going to the museum to a concert. I mean, this is a friend here in Dallas, but. You know, when I was trying to help a survivor come to Dallas to speak in 2016 with SMU, you know, I wanted to tell my Japanese friend that, you know, I was doing this because I didn't want her to find out later on because we were, you know, we, you know, we were doing things as friends. So when I told her, I even when I mentioned about Comfort Woman, she just completely shut off and she didn't want it to be my friends anymore. Oh, well, yeah. And and you know what no but then you know what's really sad is that it's because I feel like it's because of her lack of education. Mm -hmm. And she just refused to talk to me and I was willing to speak because if you're standing there, I'm standing and we can kind of sort of discuss and you know come to the middle ground. But she just refused to talk to me. And then another sad I mean this was kind of my experience with I can't say there are some Japanese Americans who are very supportive, but in a few encounters were not so pleasant because one Japanese man who happened to be a like a sort of human rights activist because he was in the Japanese internment camp. And when I shared with him about like comfort women, the first thing he said to me was like, How do you know they're they're telling the truth? And oh I could not believe. He said, how can, how can you know they're telling the truth because their stories vary? Well, some comfort girls who are standing, like who are, sta like, who are captured in the north part of China versus Burma or Papua New Guinea, it's going to be completely different. But somebody who was fighting, you know, who claimed as a human rights activist to say that, I mean, that really, really shocked me. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Japan because I kind of wanted to meet, understand more about Japanese people or culture or just to, you know, have a better understanding. So that's what happened. But again, it's not about, this is not about Japan bashing. You know, it's not the people. It's because of the lack of education. That's what I believe. Uh, I don't know if you've considered this, but given the political climate of today in the United States, I think it is perfect timing that you might contact uh, Nikki Haley, who is the ambassador to the United Nations, a woman, and see if you couldn't get an audience with the UN promoting trade sanctions against Japan until this is done. And even with the United States itself. But you know, actually UN, um, I mean, UN, um, and U.S. Congress, they have spoken about this. But a lot of times, you know, what's really sad is that Japan, they're economically, they're very powerful. So like in, for example, in Southeast Asian countries, a lot of these countries, they, they, they're a little bit hesitant to speak up because, because, you know, because of the economic problems that they could possibly face. So a lot of times, Japanese government, they actually, the, when the statue was erected, like they, they don't just have it in Seoul, they have it in Busan, they have one in Glendale, they have one in Atlanta. They're trying to erect every, you know, more. Because Japanese government, they specifically tried to remove the statue. So can you imagine like Germany trying to tell, hey, we need to, you need to get rid of all the Holocaust museums, memorials. I mean, that's what they're doing. And yet they're getting away because a lot of people are not speaking up and saying something about it. So sadly, like in Philippines, they had a memorial, but with so much, so much pressure from the Japanese government saying that, you know, we won't trade with you, we won't give you economic aid, then they, they took it out. So that's the situation. Like for example, this movie, you know, a lot of times they're very good working behind. And like I said, they spend like $500 million, you know, they spend money hiring professors at universities, giving money, taking people trips to Japan for... So it's, 
they're really working very nicely to create the good image, but they haven't really done anything about like the negative or things that they have done that they need to own up. So that's why we need to really, really learn all aspects. And Fukushima too. You know, they're very good at kind of sort of evading, hiding, not mentioning. And you wonder why so many media is not covering this issue. You wonder. Um, I can think of two organizations where you might speak. What's your contact information? Yes. Butterfly, oh, unforgotten butterflies at gmail.com or my name is Sinmin and so letter to Sinmin at gmail.com. Like writing a letter, mm -hmm. L E T T E R, and then T O Sinmin, F I N M I N. Yeah. L letter, like L E T T E R, to T O Sinmin, S. Like Sam, I like ice cream, N like Nancy, M like Mary, I like ice cream, and N like Nancy at gmail.com. Or unforgotten butterflies at gmail.com. Because we want to make sure they are not forgotten. So unforgotten. They're not forgotten, they're, they're unforgotten butterflies. With you plural. Do you have a flyer about the movie? Um, or can we, is there one online? You said put it on social media. Yes. Yeah. Actually, it's at SMU at 1010, and you know, if you Google spirits homecoming, like spirit, mm -hmm. and then it's S, and then posture mm -hmm. So it's like many spirit, you know, the directors oh, want, like, mm -hmm. he's helping the spirits return home. So it's called Spirit Homecoming. And there's a movie called Spirit Homecoming, that's the original that I mentioned. And the sequel came out, Spirit Homecoming Unfinished Story. And then there's another one that's a long way around. But, you know, right now I can scream Spirit Homecoming and Spirit Homecoming Unfinished Story. So if you have any organizations, and if we have a video, you know, I can just hook it up and play it for you, for free. But it's October 10, it's at SMU, so if you're available, it's a Wednesday at 6 p.m. Are you a corporation or associated with a certain organization or are you just doing this? I'm sort of doing it on the low. You know, I'm just because I, I hope to start a nonprofit. But right now, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to share this story and like through I'm just sharing with you today, but when you go home you will be probably sharing with your friends so eventually, you know, we can just add on and on and I really believe that we really can make a difference. Here. We can really start something. And of course, this issue has been, you know, ongoing, like in California, Washington, New York, but in Texas, it's something new. You know, people okay. have not really heard. That's why. How did you leave Tom? I'm sorry? How did you leave Tom? Oh, actually, I met Michelle, and we, we were actually at a, one of the Chem That Thing event. And I, you know, whenever I meet somebody, I always ask, do you know about Comfort Woman? And some people, when they say yes, you know, but a lot, of, believe me, a lot of people don't know. Well, when they do know, it's not really accurate, or they only know a small portion. So that's when I started to share with her about this, and then she said, oh, you know, I know Tom, and you know, College of Complexes, and you might be really, you know, per the person to go and speak. So that's how we got connected. No more questions? I think that's it. You can just sit down. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now it's your turn to talk, so who wants to be first? We've got five minutes. Come on up here. Who wants to be first? For or against what the speakers had to say? Well, I appreciate what our speaker had to say. Um, and all, this is an older issue, I guess, from World War II, uh, but as you mentioned, it's still going on, and uh, our, uh, Donald Trump started a massive investigation of pedophilia recently when he, when he got into office, and I understand there are thousands, probably approaching 10,000 arrests so far of people that are doing um, this kind of stuff. Uh, I guess you would call it pedophilia if they were doing young girls. 
Um, so although this is an old issue for the, these comfort women, um, it's still going on, and there's still sex slaves, and there's still children that are being held in cages um, to be used, and many of them are used in satanic rituals and sacrificed. Uh, so there's a lot of nastiness below the surface, and um, and there are efforts being being made to deal with this stuff and arrest people, and it's kind of interesting that with all of the effort going on to arrest these people and dig into this kind of stuff, our major media don't even mention it. Why, what is the, what is the, um, how would we find out about this? You know uh, about look, up, look up child sex trafficking, and you will find all kinds of hits, or satanic ritual abuse, it's all over. The Ninth Serpent. There's, there's there's all kinds of names and stuff, and there's lots of people um, that that testify to this stuff. Uh, there, there's just a lot of it, and so this is definitely an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and it's but it's much much bigger than just the comfort women from World War II. It's much much bigger, and it does need to be dealt with. It. Paris, I apologize for getting here late. I've been going through some things and was very tired and took a short nap that turned out to be a long one. So I'm sorry to come in late. We started late, so you were almost on time. Well, then that worked out. Uh, very good presentation. And you come across very well with it, too. I hope you do continue quite a bit. And as Ken just said, this is a very important issue but it is part of a much greater issue in all of the human trafficking that is going on today. One big issue uh, is human trafficking for body parts. Uh, it's like if you need a heart transplant, plant, you're lucky to live long enough on the waiting list to get one before you die. Nelson Rockefeller had, what, four of them, I think. He wow. had the money. And I met some guys in Florida, one guy who was involved in the trade of kidnapping teenage children in Central and South America and bringing them into the United States for this trade. And they turned in the names of some of the border guards and there were some arrests made and then a few days later these guys were back at their jobs with no charges filed. And they realized, oh boy, this thing goes a lot higher than we thought. So they went back to Central and South America and they're training the parents to not let their children, and it's teenage children because they're old enough that it's mature organs, and yet they want the ones that are out in the, the wilderness more, the villages, because they're not contaminated with all the stuff we have in the cities. And uh, they're talking to the parents and telling them to not let their children out of their sight 24-7. And then the trade moves out a little farther, and they move out, <clears throat> out a little farther, and so forth. It, and the, the Satanism is a big aspect of it, too. But what you're on is so much easier for people to grasp and understand. I think it's a great avenue into the, all of the human trafficking. And I really do think that Nikki Haley might listen to you, and you might get an audience with the UN, and you might get some tariffs or some trade restrictions because when this gets out to the public, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to stand up and say, well, we'd never do anything like that. They need some sanctions. It might work. And our government today might stand right behind it because of their putting in trade sanctions and so forth. Best of, of luck on everything. Well, I certainly don't know where to begin. I certainly have no idea how I could say anything in five minutes on this subject. But I'll try. Um, <clears throat> my uh, younger sister gave me several ex-brother-in-laws, and uh, nobody laughed. So you're, 
<clears throat> anyway, one of them was dating a Japanese girl, and he's over there in Japan, and she invited him to go out swimming with her. So he met her at the pool, he went in, he changed, and he came out, and uh, no one was in the pool. And uh, so he went over to her and he said, well, what's going on? And she said, we're resting right now. And he said, okay. So he went over and he did a cannonball into the water and she would never have anything to do with him again. What was going on there? The Japanese people very much look to others as uh, they, they really kind of function in a kind of a mild collective group setting. They're going to look for whoever is kind of the leader and then they will do what the leader does. So if you want a key to breaking this subject open, you need to get a Japanese leader to come forward. Because then that will be okay for other Japanese to admit that and follow suit. Until that happens, I don't think you'll make any progress there. Um, human trafficking. Here in this country, much of the human trafficking is going on in plain sight, but completely hidden from the average view. And uh, it's, it's kind of like, well, Hugh Hefner and, and Playboy. Well, you know, we all thought that's a very forward-looking magazine and everything. Those, those gals were, in fact, um, they were call girls. They were courtesans. Maybe not every one of them, maybe not every single one, but in general, the Playboy bunnies uh, were available for, uh, for men. And uh, you have things like that going on. We have a lot of gentlemen's clubs and, and, and things here. And um, how much is consensual and how much is really not consensual? When you look deeper into this, you find that many of these pretty women, and I'm kind of referring to the movie, if any of you have saw the movie, um, many of these pretty women were uh, horribly treated when they were younger, and uh, they were raised as victims of abuse, and they really never knew anything but. By the time they're an adult, they're ready to be used by, uh, by men, men abused. Um, I don't know what to say about the Japanese military. They were exceedingly cruel as militaries go, but they're not by any means the only ones in history. You have this thing about human nature. We're in these human bodies, and uh, you have send men out to fight. Well, you're activating all of the lower nature to fight or flight, and uh, um, you've got the animal reptilian brain activated and, and these guys are not behaving on their best on their Sunday best. And so it takes a lot of discipline. There are two generals who dealt with that discipline very sternly. One was George Washington. George Washington would execute his soldiers if if they were out raping. If he found out that they had been out there uh, raping uh, women, he would in fact have them executed uh, by dawn. And uh, one of the reasons, which made very good sense, is then the uh, armies fighting for American independence from Britain looked like the good guys because the British were committing horrible uh, atrocities. So he was able to gain the moral high ground. Another general who uh, did the same practice was General George S. Patton. I don't know if they were executed uh, immediately, but he, if he ever caught his men engaging in, in that, then uh, they were toast. They were gone. Um, but that's a really uh, that's a difficult thing to do in, in the military when you want men out there fighting every day so forth. So you've got to activate something higher in the men, and some some leaders are able to do that. Most leaders never have been able to do that. And, uh, you know, then you can come around to the question which seems to be very popular these days. Well, I guess it's all, you know, there's just something wrong with men. 
none of us would be here if somebody didn't tango. If, if we were all uh, above reproach in all activities, then you wouldn't have a lot of humans around. And, um, you know, people kind of struggle with these moral issues. It's uh, dealing with the, the sexual subject is something that's a challenge for every generation, and especially for mothers raising sons. Because then you've got your opportunity to inculcate in that young man how, how he should behave with women. That's your chance right there. And I've got much more to say, but that will do for now. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, my first thought when I saw the small crowd here tonight, maybe true, maybe not true, is it's a women's issue, so there's not a big crowd here tonight. Um, recently I attended a meeting at Mental Health America and they are putting together a task force that addresses mental health issues, particularly of children. And they were talking about the children on the streets of Dallas and how did they get in touch with the schools and so forth. Anyway, they're just starting it. That was the first meeting. So if anyone is interested in being, keeping posted on that, uh, I'd be glad to do that. Just let me know. But one thing they said at the meeting was that they have a lot of children, not just girls, but children living in vacant houses now whose parents were deported and the children have no place to live and they're living in vacant houses in Dallas. So that's that's their first thing. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I think they're living in Walmart centers as well. Well, I guess I'm the last one standing, so anyway, I want to thank our speaker for doing a great job here. Thank you. Thank you. All thank you. And, and, uh, what to what our future is, is to hold for us. In our society, we have many things that are wrong, including what you brought up tonight. And, and, trying to get a Supreme Court justice, that's another problem. It just goes on and on. Yeah. Under, underlying all of this, in my view anyway, is, is economy. When, when half society, when we have 25 million people out of work, uh, you, you breed a lot of these problems. And when you have <coughs> everybody working again, you don't, have, you don't have as many problems. In 1938, they shortened the workday in this country. For, it's 10 hours, 8 hours. In my view, we need to go to 6 hours. We'd have 25 million people back to work that we don't have now today. And we need to put tariffs on corporations that have left our country to go where labor costs are cheaper and get the jobs back here. And then maybe we can shorten the workday. And we, we have a Congress, we get the best Congress money can buy. That's one of our problems. And uh, we need to do something about that. And what, what, what we, Congress has whoever, any of this stuff has to be passed by Congress. So we need, we need a Congress that will represent the people instead of representing the people buying their vote in Washington. In my view, Congress will vote for free airtime the last 90 days of a general election because there's no history of a challenger being the incumbent in this century. It hasn't happened. And they get to keep the money they raise, they have free airtime. The, the bait is too strong. And when that happens, some challengers will beat someone coming because they'll get free airtime too. And when that happens, Congress will represent the people who are the electing. They put tariffs on corporations, they can shorten the work day, they put a lot of people back to work. Then you're going to have more people working, paying taxes, less people not working, draining taxes. The government will get too full benefit to increase tax revenue without raising taxes. Less bills will pay for people who are working as they are working. You got a better society. Then you can attack these things that you brought up. And we have less problems in other areas. That's that's my view anyway. Thank you. You're up. Uh, 
I just thank you so much again for inviting me and you know um, having the opportunity to share with you about comfort women issue. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, reemphasize that this was systematically ran, you know, uh, ran by the military. So, and it was like largest scale of sex trafficking done by military uh, system. And then, actually, and one, one more thing, there was one Japanese soldier that came to the house of sharing, and he actually kneeled, and he held one of the survivor's hand, and he apologized. And he said that at that time, he had no idea who they were. He just, he, they were told that these girls were prostitutes. So they sort of dehumanized these girls, so to make soldiers think it was okay, whatever they did. But later when he realized, when he learned that these girls, you know, the situation, then there was the biggest guilt that he couldn't deny. So he came and he met with the survivor and he kneeled and he apologized to her. So I feel like it's, it's the ignorance or not knowing the truth. That's what bring, you know, make people do. So that's one of the reasons why I feel like raising awareness and education and educating about this issue is really, really relevant. And Japan was never, they were never accountable for their crime. And they got away with it. They got a free pass. And therefore, we're creating a, like a society atmosphere that when you commit, when you take a, you know, when you have a, when you take the dignity, I mean, we know better to steal or take somebody's water bottle, right? We know better than that. But to take away a dignity of a human being, I mean, and yet no conscience about like what we're doing wrong. I mean, I think it's really society, as a society, I think we need to do more to do that. Um, and another thing about like, about comfort women issue, you know, what I shared with you, that's only the surface. It's more gruesome, more horrific, and I really could not share with you here. But you know, at least we we can. What we need to do is a create a society with a clear message that any type of sexual violence under any circumstances are not acceptable in the past, present, and in the future. Thank you. I do have books, so if you're interested, I mean, you, you, you are more than welcome to take a look. And oh, and then another, what would be, what would be ideal, would be, I would love to have.